Life sometimes come at you fast Tragedies make your life unravel You feel like you wanna give up and stay locked down Even when your heart is shattered You still got a life to live You still got a life to live So don't give up We are beautiful miracles We are beautiful miracles We are beautiful miracles So don't Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today on my podcast, Beautiful Tragedy. If you like what you're hearing, would you please like, comment, share, and subscribe? And today, I am joined by my friend, Michelle Benio. She is a fellow angel parent, and our stories um, are different, but we definitely have some similarities, and I think we have a lot to offer to each other and as, as well as offer to other parents who've lived through the nightmare of losing your child. So thank you so much for being here, Michelle. Oh, Carrie, I'm happy to be here. This will be a fun conversation about a not so fun topic. It is a not fun topic, but Mm -hmm. you know, it's something that happens to lots of people. And so, you know, together, I really think that we can make a difference and hopefully say even just one thing that might help encourage another parent who's Mm -hmm. going through what what we've been through. So if you wouldn't mind, I would love if you would share your story about your children Mm -hmm. and kind of how this all came to be. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm the mom of two children. My son, David, um, died at the age of not quite seven, actually 21 years ago. And, um, I was an early childhood parent educator at the time working with families of young children and um, thought my world was perfect. I had my son, David, who was four and a half and my daughter, who was 15 months when he was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And we battled it for two and a half years. And he died, as I said, just before the age of seven. And she was three and a half. And she actually said to me, mommy, half of me is gone. Mm. And I knew a lot about kids this age. My whole purpose in life at that point was uh, for parents to give young children the best start possible for them to, uh, you know, be understood and nourished and cared for. And here was a situation that I just really knew nothing about. I didn't know how to do this. I knew how to do a lot of things but not this. And I thought I was probably in a good position to find resources because this was my career, but there were not resources out there for how to raise a child, an early childhood age child who said, mommy, half of me is gone Mm. after her sibling died. Of course, they'd been very close. Um, They'd spent her whole life together. So this was a challenge for me. And I pretty much knew then being the educator at heart that I was, that I am, that um, if there was nothing out there to help parents like me someday, I was going to have to provide that support. And so now these years later, my beautiful daughter is 25 and I've raised her and I've learned a lot. I've continued to glean everything about sibling loss that I could over the years. And now I have founded good grief parenting to help other parents who have young children, like mine and like yours, um, who have lost an, a sibling. Yeah, that's, it's wonderful. I mean, like, it seems like in a way your background, uh, definitely prepared you mm-hmm. for this, but you know, when, when your son got sick, how did you tell your daughter? How did you talk to her about it? Because she was so young. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting because she she very early on taught me, taught us that she was on this journey as much as we were. She, um, you know, she, of course, and this is why. I do this work because people have lots of misconceptions about very young children and exposing them to this. Um, The first night that our son went to the hospital, 
uh, stayed overnight. He was with his dad and I was home with her and she was 15 months old and she wandered around the house just wailing. She was making an inhuman sound wandering upstairs and downstairs and just I'd go to her to try to comfort her and she'd throw herself on the floor. She was just beside herself Mm -hmm. that her dad and her brother were gone and she had picked up you know what was going on in our family she knew something was terribly wrong and from that point on I I knew that there was no way that three of us were going to be on this journey without her in other words every time he went to the hospital for the next two and a half years and we were both there with him she was there too we just um knew that even though we lived in a neighborhood where we had many caring people who would have loved to have cared for her and many families make that choice to not expose the healthy child to the trauma of what's going on but we said she knows she's feeling this and it would be worse for her to not um you know not be able to to understand and know what was happening so she was a part of the journey from the very beginning and um and really you know saw and um was with us through many things saw the kids in the hospital saw him in pain at times i mean of course we didn't expose her to every horrific thing but she she was pretty well um informed about what was going on I would imagine 21 years ago that you were probably kind of breaking the mold doing that back then, you know, I mean, cause mm-hmm. did, were they, did they even have like the child life specialists at the hospital or were, were there people there to kind of help, you know, answer there questions? There were, we were in a children's hospital and they were really geared to siblings, which was part of what made this um, really an easy thing to do. We were at Children's Hospital in Minneapolis and they had sibling play. So whenever we took her to the hospital, if she couldn't be immediately with us in David's room, she'd be down in sibling play. And there were, you know, there were child life specialists working with the siblings, getting to know them just as there were with with David, our son. And there were a lot of activity. There were a lot of cases where she could be with him. You know, I'm so glad. I think things have changed a bit, especially, of course, during the pandemic. But even before then, I'm not sure that she I mean, she she had the run of the place really pretty much um, as much as David did. She could be with him a lot. And the uh, the adults that worked with him were just as concerned and caring with her as they were with him. And so it really was, I mean, that's the only way they were able to develop that relationship for those two and a half years from her 15 months to two and a half or three and a half years, he was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And if she hadn't been able to be there in that environment, she wouldn't have had nearly the relationship with him that she did. So it was wonderful care. We were very blessed. Um, Yeah. So it it was good. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times I feel like as parents, we sort of want to protect our child from pain and hardships and seeing things that, you know, Mm -hmm. we used to want to protect kids from, but I happen to be of a different mindset, um, that, you know, first of all, kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. If Mm -hmm. you think that they don't know what's going on, that's not true. They absolutely Mm -hmm. do. And, you know, opening the doors like that for her to be able to ask questions and understand, I would imagine it probably shaped her as a person. It did very much. It did at the time. And it's certainly now that I've looked at her grow up, um, you know, it, it really has made her understand loss and grief and um, hardship, not only at the time of, of what we were going through as a family then, but also what it was like for her after her brother died. Yeah. And she had this piece of her life and her identity and her development that was very, um, very deep and very difficult and really impacted her socially in a lot of ways that people didn't understand understand. So she's very aware of other people's things that people don't always see. Um, 
And we really did feel, I mean, as as you acknowledged, most families wouldn't have made that decision. They especially she was only 15 months Mm -hmm. in the beginning, Mm -hmm. Um, but we exposed her to it and it was good for her. Um, And I believe that I mean, we had this. This was our family. This was what we were going through. I would never have chosen it for her, but, or for him or for any of us, but it was part of her life. And so really the best thing was to help her go through it. And I have come to really believe that um, childhood is the best time for children to learn these tough things. We do want to protect them, but they feel it anyway, her wandering around the house, the way that night, I wasn't a mess that night. I wasn't, you know, crumbled on the floor. She was just, she was feeling this. And so had I not, you know, been honest with her over the coming weeks and and let her understand what was happening, she would have been, had all of this stuff bundled up inside. Mm. Um, We really do sell children short, as you said, they're Mm -hmm. so much smarter than we give them credit for so much more aware Mm -hmm. and perceptive. Yeah. You know, I, um, you all of when you lose your child, there's all these things that you think about um, that you just don't know how you're going to deal with it. You know, I, I'm Ivan's approaching mm-hmm. um, seven, mm-hmm. and that is uh, Jackson's age when he died. And mm-hmm. you know, it's like okay, anything that happens beyond that, you know, this is all uncharted territory. I mean, we got we're getting a crash course on the job training as we're doing this. You yes. know, and you know, as I always say, there is no parenting handbook, and there certainly isn't one for how do you deal with, uh, you know a grieving child while you're grieving also. And, you know, I think a lot about, um, you know, what are some of the things that, um, you know, did she have a lot of anxiety? Um, You know, just kind of some of the things that went on as she got a little bit older and like, how did Mm -hmm. you deal with that? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because if, had she not said to me, um, at three and a half, mommy, half of me is gone. I didn't, I wouldn't have seen it in her because the children deal with it in so many different ways. And from early on, even before David died, the way Deanna dealt with what was happening in our family was to not rock the boat to do whatever she could to be well behaved to be compliant she went through her twos and threes while he was in the hospital and we know what that age Mm. is not for her she toilet trained herself completely she um she was just as good as gold and after he died and I knew she had said this, we would talk, but she didn't really share a lot of her feelings with me. And that's one piece of advice that I would share with anyone listening is, uh, you know, people helped me because this was new to me. You're right. I didn't know how to do this at all. And people said, be sure that you don't hide your feelings from your child. You know, it's okay for them to see you. So we talked about it and, um, I shared my feelings, but I didn't do a lot of asking her to share hers which I see now was the next step that I should have taken. And I would really invite parents to do that, to just say things like, oh, I'm really missing David today. Um, You know, I miss that he's not here for this. When do you miss David? How do you miss David the most? And let them have a chance to tell you what their experience is. So, we didn't do a lot of talking about her, but talking about those milestones, and this is where I thought you were maybe going with um, with Ivan, was that um, when Deanna, David died in kindergarten, and when Deanna was in kindergarten on picture day, they called me 
because she was very upset. She was having a hard day. And to this day, when I look at her kindergarten picture, I see the little girl who was realizing she was the age that her brother was when he died. And it shows in her picture. She was having such a hard time getting her kindergarten picture taken. And so... You know, it wasn't just for you. It's not just for you and me. It's for them, too. You know, um, when David was a senior, would have been a senior, she, of course, was his younger sister, but she was keenly aware that he should have graduated that year. And she she drew a picture of him. She she drew a picture of him in his cap and gown with a valedic- valedictorian sash on. Aww. So he would have been the valedictorian. And when she was in college and was in a poetry writing class, she her anthology was called Every Poem is a Dead Brother Poem. And so she, you know, she lost him at the age of three and a half, but she just carried this. And the place that I saw it on the more day to day basis was in the way that she did social relationships, because she was always trying to get someone that was hers and um And so she'd kind of do friendship a little bit too, too, too much, kind of too aggressively, sometimes too close, sometimes. Um, And she struggled with some of that. So that's what I saw in her. I know for you, you experienced anxiety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, with Ivan only three and a half, it was like, he saw that his brother, because because Jackson's story wasn't years of fighting. It was he entered the hospital and six days later he died. So in right. Ivan's mind, it's like, wait a second, you can be here and then all of a sudden not be here. And so he was right. terrified, you know, that that was going to happen to Mike and I. And I mean, the truth of the matter is, you know, he asked me questions like, mom, am I going to die when I turn seven? And I say, Mm -hmm. I hope not, you know, but Ivan, we're going to do everything we can to keep you safe because I don't get to give those kind of false promises anymore. Like everything's going to be okay. It's it's just fine, you know, and because also that doesn't, you know, that squashes their feelings. And, and I can tell so many times with Ivan where his anxiety comes in is he gets a thought in there and it just starts going all over, you know, and it's Mm -hmm. like, He has to be able to process it. And sometimes I can help him with that and other Mm -hmm. times I can't. And Mm so I even ask him, you know, do you want to go see your therapist? And not that long ago, he said, I don't have any mads or sads. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, I mean, you know, the sad part is that at three and a half, kids are still learning about their emotions. And then they have something that just throttles them like that, you know, so then they're having to learn how to deal with that. And they, they just, sadly, they know things that other kids their age don't know because right. it hasn't happened to them. And, right. you know, so I, I always have this little twinge of worry, you know, well, what's going to happen, you know, but um, our therapist always just reassures us. He says, kids that experience this a lot of times really grow up to be very empathetic right. children who think of others and they know they know the struggles more than anybody else. And as you said, we, we wouldn't wish this for our children, but unfortunately this is, you know, this is the story, but you know, I really love that you also have made something beautiful of, mm-hmm. you know, something terrible with what you're doing with the good grief parenting. So I would love for you to share about that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, The two hardest things that we ever have to do as adults is parent a child under the best of circumstances because there's no manual and too many variables and grieve a loved one. And when we're doing the both at the same time, it's it's unbearable. And with my daughter, knowing how this was um, 
had hurt her and what she had lost was so even as hard as it was for me to you lose my beautiful firstborn son for her to lose her brother and not have him to grow up with because like you she didn't have any other siblings and so she's not an only she's a sibling but her brother's not here and that's a hard place to be and we don't know how to do that so right away my mission became her it became this unseen child who has this loss no one sees their loss um you know she had two parents but she didn't have this brother and no one, you know, people didn't always know that he was supposed to be there. So, and I knew how deeply it impacted her. I had to be her advocate because I was the only one that knew that story. Um, So I knew way back then that I was going to be helping parents figure out how to do this. But what I didn't realize was that it was going to take me so long to be able to actually put myself out there as a support person because of all that I was dealing with in myself. And I was, you know, I was um, embracing life. I call it living forward. I was able to live forward. We did a lot of lemonade making. That was sort of my um, approach at the beginning. I don't want this lemon, but I've got it. So what are we going to do with it? We're going to, you know, I don't want this for her, but it's this way. So how are we going to make the best of it? But then there was me dealing with all of the secondary losses that I bumped into as well as hers, all the places where I wished I had my son. Mm. Um, So good grief parenting started out as being parenting this child who feels whether they articulate it or not, half of me is gone. Mm. And I knew that that was true. That was a very true piece that half of her was gone. Her identity was, was part of it was ripped away from her, Mm -hmm. but the parent too needs support. So good grief parenting is helping parents um, help their child who is grieving while they are grieving and looking at both of those relationships with the child who has died and with others in the family. There are so many relationships that need to be examined. And there's so much that that child who's growing up needs to be given that no one is going to give them but you Mm. because no one else knows they need it. Mm. And you as a parent, um, often parents don't understand the child needs it. That's sort of where I start because I've met adults who said, I wish you were here when my sibling died because my parents were so broken and they didn't realize what I needed and I didn't get support. Mm. So. I have a a four, uh, I call them four heartbeats, sort of a four uh, pillared approach uh, where I look at, first of all, just really what grief is, because there's a lot we believe about it that isn't totally accurate and isn't helpful. Grief is really something good that when we go through it is healing. Mm. I look at the bonds with the child we've lost and how healthy it is to continue those bonds as well as nurture bonds with others around us. And the essential messages is a third thing that children really need to have growing up. Um, Things about themselves. You gave me one of the best essential messages, Carrie, when you told me that what you say to Ivan is, we are so sad that Jackson is gone, but we are so glad that you are still here. The child needs to know when we are missing our lost child so desperately that yes, honey, we see you there and we're Mm. so glad you're here. Mm -hmm. That's a really important essential message. And then the last pillar is uh, just the actions that we take to put all of this in place while we're parenting, because parenting is difficult and it changes all the time. And as kids grow, it will change and we need to adjust with it. Mm. So Mm. it sounds Mm -hmm. so, so amazing. And I, you know, bringing that up, um, you know, after Jackson died, we were just obsessively looking at pictures and videos and crying and just so mm-hmm. sad. And, you know, Ivan was at an age where he still needed us for everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember 
exactly where this was. We were laying in bed, watching videos, and Ivan said, Mom, what about pictures of me? And it was like, oh, I mean, even though he was there, and obviously yes. you know it, but it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm not giving him the attention that he needs, but it is so hard. And it was mm -hmm. like, when I said those words to him, it was like it settled his little soul, you know? Of course. And I really feel like it's a picture of um, how my heart feels, you know? It's like it's split into two. Mm -hmm. my, my heart is sad and I miss Jackson, but my other part of my heart is here uh, wanting to do anything I can to help Ivan because, right. you know, he didn't have any choice in the matter. And, you know, my background really taught me how to reach out for resources. And I feel like if my message is nothing else, it is that you don't have to do this alone. There right. is help available. And really that's the whole reason that I started the podcast because I want to be what I was looking for mm -hmm. when, when I lost Jackson, because I was grasping at anything to just make it hurt a little bit less and parenting while grieving is so, so, so hard. And I, and yes. I, I had, and I had realized something and it sometimes feels hard for me to say this, but somebody asked me at one time, was I mad at Ivan? And to, it feels wrong to say that out loud, but there was a part of me that felt like because I had to tend to him, I couldn't tend to my own needs. And mm -hmm. so it's not like I'm angry at him. It's just that there's so, you know, there's just so much inside that you have to really have to really deal with. And so, you know, my attention went right away to Ivan after Jackson died. And then my husband got very sick and my attention went to him. Well, then in the meantime, guess what happened? Mm -hmm. I lost myself. Yeah, you got lost in the shuffle. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of in a, in a, a healing journey right now, which I will always be, you mm -hmm. know, working on that. But um, I'm really trying to, um, you know, figure out how to balance all that. And it really sounds like uh, your class um, can be a good way to do that. Yes. And, and it's running right now. I'm feeling it right now. It's a, my course, see your way forward after child loss is a seven week program. It's starting this week and it entails um, some teachings through videos as well as group zoom calls. And um, the zoom calls are so important because they give you this community that talks not only a community, because there are a lot of communities on Facebook, which didn't exist. None of that existed when I needed support. Um, but not all of the communities that you have access to are seeing their way forward. Absolutely. And for me, I talk about living forward and there's no, I, I want to say there's no right way to grieve and there's no right time frame. But at some point, you don't want to give up your life and your living child's life um, and joy and happy childhood because of this. You need to see your way forward. And that's what I help families do. So I just really would invite anybody listening to check out this program. Um, you can um, register for it or find information for it on my website. And maybe Carrie, I'll give you the specific page. My website is goodgriefparenting.com mm -hmm. and you can find, um, a, you can connect with me there on Instagram. I'm at goodgriefparenting. Actually, that's a better place to go because I have the link for the class in Instagram. Okay. Um, but certainly look it up. I also love to talk to people. I'm happy to talk with anyone who wants to hear more, whether it ends up being the right thing or not. I would love to just have a chat with you and Instagram in my link tree 
um, links. Uh, all of this is there to talk with me and to learn more about the program. And then at my website, Good Grief Parenting. Okay. But you you said two things, Carrie, that I just want to circle back on. And one is um, the importance of uh, reaching out for help because the most important thing, and one of the places I start when I talk to parents is with self-care because you may want to take care of your child, but if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not taking care of your child. You're not being a good role model for them. And you're not, you're not helping them um, the way that you could, if you were taking care of yourself better. So self-care is so important. And sometimes it means you need to ask someone to help you so that you can take time for you. And I'm so glad that you, that you tell people that because uh, the most important thing is for you and your family to get on a a level ground and to have the tools and insights and resources you need to decide and you get to choose. This is another important point. You get to choose how you're going to live forward from here. And you don't have to just be a, you don't have to be a victim of your loss and your grief. You can choose some good things to live forward toward. Yes, it absolutely is a choice. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, the idea of the community, um, I really love that because there's nothing like being a bereaved parent and talking to another bereaved parent. But when you have people that are dedicating their life to learning how to live with grief Mm -hmm. and joy, uh, there's, there's gotta be something different about that because I'll admit when I first uh, lost Jackson and I was again, searching for anything, I got into some online support groups and it scared me away very quickly because it was like, Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten out of bed in 10 years or, um, I'm getting Mm -hmm. a divorce because we couldn't deal, you know, we just couldn't deal with it. And it was like, that's very terrifying um, when you're just trying to find your bearings and, you know, and then seeing stuff like that. And actually in, um, the episode that I did with Megan, we talked about, um, how trauma affects the brain. And, you know, if you, and, and I'm, and this is certainly not a a dig at support groups because I'm a big fan of support groups, but there are times when you have people in there that are kind of going in a circle and, Mm -hmm. and, you Mm -hmm. know, and, and that can be um, somewhat discouraging when Mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out how to live with this loss, you know, and right. if you're, if you're one year in and you see somebody seven years in, that's still very, very angry. It's like, Oh gosh, I don't know if that's what I want or, you, you know, I mean, you absolutely. Know. Yeah, I I discovered a quote early on in my good grief parenting journey, and it is in it and it's how I explain the work I do. It's such a good quote. Um, An author, Anne Royfe, wrote a book after her husband died, and she said, grief is in two parts. The first part is loss. And the second part is the remaking of life. Mm -hmm. Grief support groups are there at the time of loss. You've lost this person. You're devastated. You don't know what to do. The pain is excruciating. Mm -hmm. I am the next step, the remaking of life. Your child has their whole lifetime ahead of them. So do you, Mm -hmm. and you get to remake it. And that's what I help you do. Identify what you want it to look like and how to do it your way, not anyone else's way, your way. Yeah. And so it's a, I really want to give parents that hope and that confidence and that optimism to look at life after this worst of all losses and know that you can still have a good life and live forward. And if I can be honest, um, I tend to um, get a little stuck in getting too far out into the future scares me a lot. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. so I've gotten to where I'm like, okay, I can do right now. I can do this now, but thinking about that. But then again, it's like, it's almost like I'm always kind of preparing for the next thing that's going to knock me down. And that also doesn't feel good either. Mm -hmm, You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I just feel like, 
I still, even all, two and a half years in, sort of feel like I'm still trying to find my bearings with all of it, you know, because mm-hmm. of course life still happens, <laughs> you know, yes. we're also living in a pandemic and, you know, so it's like, there's just all these other things. And it's like, I really do want to equip myself as well as I can. Cause like you said, if I'm not taking care of me, I'm practically worthless to my child who needs me, you know? Right. And I, Mm -hmm. I, I tend to be, um, pretty good at the outside stuff. Like I get myself ready. I go get myself coffee. I exercise, you know, and those are all good things. Those are amazing. Those are wonderful things not to be discounted at all. (laughs) No, but I also, I tend to, um, shy away sometimes from the hard work of grief and you know um I don't know it's it's tough I mean we neither one of us I don't think are ever going to make it seem like it's easy it's doable but it's hard and it's also unique you know there isn't a right way to do it and I really want people to hear that from me because you're not going to come you're not going to work with me or come into my program and I'm not going to tell you how to do it I'm going to tell you how to discover what's possible for you and the time frame you're going to do it in. I I love that you talked about the, um, you know, not being able to look too far ahead because when I started this program, one of the pieces that I have in it is what I call a good grief mind view. And I use the word mind view instead of mindset, because to me, it's that ability to, to lift up your eyes from where you're standing. Mm. And part of you doesn't want to leave here because this is where your child was and you don't want to leave here. And I think a lot of people listening know that feeling of I don't necessarily really want to feel better because I I'm honoring my child by feeling bad. Well, I encourage you to have to be able to lift up your face and look out at the horizon and get a view of what's possible. But I and that's where I kind of started. But I recognize that for some people, what they are able to do is just take the first step. And, you know, if you're just looking at the next first step, that's okay too. You don't have to look at the horizon. You can just look a little in front of you and go there first. And so there isn't just one way to do it. It's just recognizing that you do have some place to go and that you have the wisdom and the resources within you to go there and make progress. Yeah. I I love that. You know, you, you need that hope and, Mm -hmm. um, one of the things our therapist says, well, um, I quote him a lot, um, but I, when we say, oh, I should be doing this, I should be doing that, and he says, stop shouldn't all over yourself mm-hmm. because there is no, you know, right, like you said, no right or wrong, no time mm-hmm. frame, but it's hard to fight that when society tells us something different. You know, we Absolutely. should be, well, you know, didn't you go through all the phases? So shouldn't you be over it? And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, I feel like we're working to kind of destigmatize that at the same time as, you know, sharing our own experience and stuff. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done, but I feel like I would imagine that there's a difference between now and when you lost your son, as far as resources available. Uh, definitely. But I still find there are not, a, there, there aren't people doing what I'm doing. Yeah. There are a lot of uh, support groups and there are getting to be a few more parenting components of those support groups. Yeah. What I do that's different is that I look all the way down the road um, in, you know, Hope Edelman, who is has worked with motherless daughters in the grief field. And and her latest book is The After Grief. And she talks about that part of our lives beyond the loss where we just keep experiencing it in different ways, not heavy duty, you know, drag you down to the gutter ways, but the grief is going to be a piece there and it certainly is for all adults who grieve it certainly is for children and they've got so many more developmental stages to go through and so it's so important for parents to have more than just a little bit of guidance about how to parent your child um, when you've experienced the loss and so um 
I feel like what I'm offering still is really not very much out there, yes. but there are so many more resources helping people understand that um, they can and need to grieve the way that they yeah. um that they do. The problem is other people aren't well-meaning people aren't catching up with that. Mm. Um, you know, people will say, don't you think it's time to put their things away because people think that's how you heal. Right. And we know instinctively as grievers that, that that's not how we heal. In fact, keeping their things and, um, and, maintaining that precious relationship in a healthy way is is a good part of healing and so there are a lot of things that society needs to learn yes and i think what you're doing is absolutely wonderful and so my last question is what could you tell a parent who is early on in their journey and everything feels impossible i would say Two things. One um, is that it does feel impossible. It isn't impossible, but right now it feels like it is. And it's okay for you to feel that. People um, might tell you you're never going to get better. You, You can get better. People might tell you it's time to move forward it's not time to move forward if you're not ready to. So the thing about grief, which is why I talk about good grief, is that you really just need to embrace it and allow it to be there. Anything you do while you're grieving, anything you feel you need to do is the right thing for you. And just and hang in there, get the support you need, but don't try to make yourself do something you're not ready for because you will find down the road that you're ready for something else just give yourself time. Yeah. I've definitely heard yeah. people say that the pain is going to be there until it loosens. I right. Mean, it's like, you know, and I got caught early on really wanting to rush it along because I'm like, mm-hmm. it just hurts so bad. Mm-hmm. It hurts mm-hmm. so bad. And yeah. so now I'm, I'm learning how to let the, let it, let it hit me when it needs to hit me. And, right. you know, and, and, and thankfully, you know, the waves, hit still, uh, but mm-hmm. they don't always take me down like they did in the yes. beginning, you know, and, and there are times where it'll be longer times in between when it takes me down, you know? And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, if, if nothing else, I would just encourage people that, um, again, there are resources out there. You don't yes. have to do this by yourself. Grief is a very lonely emotion because it's a very individual feeling, but it, you know, and again, you know, how I end every episode is my quote by Ram Das. It says, we're all just walking each other home. You know, we're, yes. we are all yes. figuring this out. And when you can do it with someone else, I mean, I just feel so fortunate to have crossed paths with you. And I just think yes, what you're doing too, is Carrie. so wonderful. And um, so I just really want to say thank you so much for mm-hmm. taking the time. And as I figured, it would be just a wonderful conversation. Yes, it always is with you, Carrie. Oh, thank, thank you, you for having me. Thank and you. I look forward to us staying in touch and just really welcome anyone hearing this podcast who would like to be in touch. Yes. Um, goodgriefparenting.com or more information that Carrie will have in the show notes. Yes, yes, I will. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Michelle. Thank you.